and in the presence of his almighty glory. You know what? First of all, before I just acknowledge how great God is, I'm in the presence of a man and a woman of God that God has his hand on and he's using to broaden the kingdom of God. Let's give them one more hand clap of praise. And glory. Now to the one and only king, the king that is over everyone, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one we glorify all the time. Let's glorify Jesus in this play. Hallelujah. There's nobody like you. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here on this day. I'm glad to be invited back again. And uh, I'm going to try to do everything I can to come back again. Because it is great being an EUMC. Amen. 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 I got to see it as a plan. It was just just a, uh, a hand-drawn plan to being able to see some structure, superstructure go up with nothing in it, to walk in here today for the fulfillment of the vision of God to occur right before my eyes. Amen. Amen. I'm going back as a witness. Let me tell you all, I am a witness now. Amen. Amen. Um, this is the third seven for this pastoral team. Now, the number three is significant all by itself. And seven is a significant number. But this is the third seventh. It starts a new, new, new beginning in this ministry in this time. This is the third seventh. I'm excited about that and uh, what God is doing. It is 21. Daniel fasted 21 days. There's all kind of significance there in that number that is number 21. And also, that's the age of responsibility. All over the nation, when you reach the age of 21, you are dispatched to be able to be responsible for yourself. This ministry has reached total responsibility from God to reproduce the things of heaven and the kingdom because you have been able to see and, and walk with this pastoral team for 21 years. So excited about the ministry and what God is doing with them while they are here. Uh, we're going to take a moment <clears throat> to take a look into God's word, but just before then, I want to tell you that this is our year for uh, elections, and I'm going to tell you somebody who belongs on our executive committee. I hope this is recorded. I'm not ashamed of it. I hope they tell everybody, because you know everybody has to secretly talk about it. I'm not secretly talking about it, but uh, Bishop Dr. R.C. Hugh Nelson needs to be running this church throughout the international, of, of, the, of, of the globally, as long as he can remain pastor of this church at the same time. Amen, amen, amen. Let us um, uh, take a moment <clears throat> to look into God's word. I'd like for you with me to um, turn to the word of the Lord, and uh, we take a, um, uh, a look uh, into um, uh, uh, into uh, God's word on uh, this blessed day. I'm going to see Mark chapter 4. Verse 35 through 41. Uh, I'll be reading out the ESV version. That's Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through verse 41. We have come thus far by the Lord's help. <clears throat> the Bible reads here, And on that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them into the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. 
but he was in the stern, asleep and on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said one to another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the word of God. Bless our time together. Bless our moment with one another, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On Christmas night in 1776, uh, at that time would have been uh, General George Washington instead of our president. He is attempting to cross the Delaware. And while he's being prepared to cross over the Delaware, the water is icy, the water is, is uh, treacherous, the water is difficult. But he knows this one thing, that if they are to recapture the war, that they're in the place of fighting, they're going to need to surprise the enemy. So they're going to need to cross over this particular area. But the Continental Army had suffered all kinds of losses. They, were, they had lost their morale. They had become weakened, and the British Army was taking a stronghold upon them. But they knew that they were just across the ocean, uh, or just across the river, the Delaware River in New Jersey. And if they could sneak up on them and attack them, this would be the surprise that was well needed. It would also re-strengthen the team. But how do they take all of this large equipment, float it across this river, get it to the other side, and do it in a way that nobody knows that they're out there? Well, George Washington says, I'm not going to inform anybody. I'm not going to tell anybody about what I'm doing because I don't want it to leak out in any way to the enemy. And we're going to have to strategically get the logistics to get across this river and attack our enemy in a surprise. If the enemy would have caught them in the middle of the river, they would have never been able to finish this battle. They knew that they had to somehow get from one side to the other, but it was treacherous. The weather was bad that day, and the soldiers were ill-prepared. They weren't even dressed to go across a wet river. Yet still, all the same, George Washington did not turn around. He knew this was a critical way for them to be able to recapture what they needed to do. They go into this river. They have many trepidations. They lose equipment while they're trying to get over to the other side. On the other side of the river is a particular well-trained, highly militarized team that was from Germany that was hired by the British to make sure that they could fight and maintain this particular colony in America. They brought this well-fighting, well-trained team so that it could hold the positions that they needed on the East Coast. However, as well as this team had been trained, George Washington knew they had to take them, and this would be an incredible accomplishment for them. They come across this river with all kinds of intrepidation, and there's water coming into the boats, and the water coming in the boats is causing the boats to be prepared to sink. Nevertheless, they continue going to the other side. When they get to the other side, the enemy is completely surprised and ill-equipped to turn and fight them back. They not only are able to take a stronghold when they get to the other side, they actually defeat the enemy there that was more qualified than they were, but because they were able to come up and surprise them, they overtook them, and this particular battle is still said for the Revolutionary War, gave the kind of morale and the kind of strength back to the Continental Army so they were able to win the war and declare freedom and liberty going forward. What I'd like to tell you that it's kind of important to cross over to the other side. 
It's kind of important to get from one side to another. It's not always easy, and there's some trepidation along the way. But if you can get from one side to the other, and when you can begin to tell each other, we're about to cross over. Sometimes you just got to confess it before it happens. George Washington just had to keep saying we're going to cross over even though he was getting information and they left four hours later than they wanted to leave. He kept telling the soldiers we are going to cross over to the other side. It's this kind of confession that drove them to be able to make this accomplishment that they were able to make. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a story about the same thing that happens with Jesus when Jesus is crossing over to the other side. Now, embedded in the background is going to be Ebenezer, but y'all hear the stories run themselves together as we come along. So we begin to find that on this particular day, <clears throat> there are a challenge that's before them three things I'd like to talk about, just the ABCs of having faith. There are three things I'd like to, like to talk to you about on the subject matter. It's on the other side. When it's on the other side, we've got to find a way to accomplish it and to get there because it's just going to be important. Jesus told the fishermen when he was with them, he said, look, they fished, they got nothing all day. And he told them, look, just throw the net where? on the other side. And so it was this that Jesus began to come back, found his disciples depressed and sad, sitting in a room all by themselves, and Jesus came to go to encourage them, but he knew there was a wall between him and them, so he walked through this wall so they could do what? Get to the other side, right? And then when he goes up to heaven and to be in the glory with the Father, we see a very traumatic experience of him dying, but it was all together so that he might what? Go to the other side and sit at the right hand of the Father. There's glory on the other side. There's kingdom on the other side. It's powerful on the other side. But we've got to cross over and might have to go through some intrepidation to be able to get there. I just want to talk to you about the ABCs of having faith and crossing to the other side. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, important that we have faith to make sure that we can make the journey. The first thing, as you look at this particular text, has to do with this issue of, ex uh, of acceptance, of accepting. We have to accept what God has begun to tell us and what God has declared for us. It is in this that he begins to tell the disciples, look, we've got to now get ready to accept what is next and what is important. Acceptance is critical, but let me tell you something about acceptance. Acceptance happens on the inside, therefore you can't make somebody accept. You can make them comply, you can make them go along with what you said, you can force them to do something, but that doesn't mean they accepted anything that you have done. Acceptance happens from in here. And I'd like to tell you that Jesus moves his disciples to a point of acceptance, and every good pastor Every strong pastor knows that God's anointing will assist him or her in making sure that he bursts in the hearts of people the ability to accept what God is calling them to do in the future. Because if you don't accept it, you can't move on it. But the Holy Spirit's got to move on you to cause you to accept something that's different than where you were before. The job of a pastor isn't simply to get people to comply. It's not just to do some kind of fancy stuff at the altar or push people down. It's a matter of getting people to now accept that God is about to do something incredible, outstanding, and it never has been done before. How do you tell people how that God's about to do something he never did before? But that is the job that a pastor is called to do. The Bible said that evening drew near. And it said that uh, when evening drew near, they got prepared to go to the other side. Now, I think it's critical that the evening was coming. It was about to get dark. The day was ending. It was closing out. At the same time when this day is ending, Jesus then announced to them that they have to cross over and go to the other side. See, there's a time in ministry when the evening is coming. 
There's a time in ministry what we've done before is closing out. There's a time in ministry when that's done, but some people will hold on to the same day and they won't let it go because it's comfortable because they know it because they understand it. They'll do the same thing over and over and over again because newness looks too strange. But it's the job of a pastor to move people to acceptance of what is different and to change. And once the pastor moves you at that evening time, he's actually asking you to accept the future, accept the tomorrow, accept what's in front of you. And so Jesus is telling them, look, you know what? Today is closing out, but that means the future is opening up. Every time when something ceases, God's beginning a new thing. And I'm interested in what God wants to do next when God starts closing out my yesterday. Because that means God is about to show me something that is so incredible that I've never done it before. And I'm excited about what God's about to do. That's why I don't have to hold on to what God already did. Here he tells his disciples, we're about to leave here and we're about to go from here. Because we are prepared to move to another level. Now, what also is critical is that he tells the crowd, I mean, the Bible tells us that the crowd had to be left behind. When they got ready to accept their future, they couldn't do what the crowd was doing anymore. They couldn't stay with everybody else. They couldn't just do the same anymore. If you just keep doing the same, you can never do what's next. And so they had to leave the crowd. The Bible said they pulled away from the crowd that was present to do something that would be different. Then the Bible informs us as Jesus moves them to leave to accept their new call, he, the Bible informs us that they went into a boat. And as they got into the boat, it says they took Jesus with them and went into a boat. Now the boat represents anything that is a vehicle that takes you from where you are to where you are going. Now, a boat's a boat. You understand what I'm saying? Boats are important. Now, I understand there's a difference between boats and ships. I just don't know the difference, so I can't help you. <laughs> but he drew them, the, the, the Bible said he drew them into, uh, they went with him into this boat because he said, we're going to cross over to the other side. Now, there's a tent of logistics that are involved here. They got to find a boat because the Bible doesn't say anywhere where they had a boat. They didn't have a boat under a, under a tree somewhere. They had to find a boat, get a boat, get the boat in the water, get ready to go. So somebody had to work out the logistics. Where are we going? What's next? What are we doing? Jesus says we're crossing over to the other side, but somebody starts working out the logistics. Uh, somebody just raise your hand. Just raise your hand for a minute. I see logistics officers all over this place. I see people called of God to work out the understanding of what it means when the pastor said, let's cross over to the other side. Put your hand up just one more time. Glory to God before heaven. You are the logistics officer. I anoint you today to be in charge of taking us to the other side. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says they worked out those logistics. What's that? Those logistics are a, an expression of vision and of mission. When, when, when a pastor can cast vision, when he can cast uh, a mission, he casts a boat that everybody's going to get into. It is that boat that serves as the vehicle to move you from one place to the next. You have been placed in a boat and have arrived on the other side. The boat may not have wood and it may not have a metal bottom, but look, it has a physical expression of what it is. I'd like to express to you that as you have arrived here, you have arrived in what was once spoken but now exists. You have arrived at what was just talked about that was not, it didn't even, it wasn't even here, from nothing to something. And then the Bible says, that other boats were with them. This acceptance is so that people begin to accept what God has called them to do, accept the vision that's in front of them. But while he's talking to his disciples, now this is all the Bible says. 
He's talking to his disciples. But everybody around is listening to him. And they're going, do you hear this vision? Do you hear what Jesus is about to do? He's about to go to the other side. And the Bible said that other folk went and got some boats. They're like, we're not missing out. They're about to do something. Something's about to go on. And they begin to join in with the disciples and get in the boats and other boats and travel with them. Now, let me tell you what they just got invited to do, to be part of the miracle. They were going to see the miracle come to pass because they got in the boat. There are people that are around that are going to, that are networking, that became part of the vision, became part of the mission simply because they heard it and they got themselves a boat and they got in the same water and they watched the miracle happen. Give God a hand clap of praise and glory. God has other boats. God still has other boats. There still are networking boats coming. There's still a boats that are going to come alongside and boats that are going to sit there and invest in the vision, invest in the outcome because they know something's happening. God's doing something in that boat right there and they've already seen a miracle. Now just lift it both hands up just for a moment. I want you to pray for me for the other boats. Dear Heavenly Father, send other boats, send other boats. Let other people see the miracle. Let other people see the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Glory to God. Send other boats. God, send people with resources. God, let us, God, be the boat that is doing the miracle so that others might aid what God is doing and expand the kingdom and the people in this neighborhood, in this community will be blessed by the glory of God. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Holy Ghost. Now give God a hand clap for what God's going to do. No one can make you accept. The Holy Spirit moves on you when the pastor ministers to you. And then two, if the first letter is A, the second letter is B, you have to be brought to a place to believe. The Bible says that there was a great windstorm. A great windstorm arose. Now, <laughs> I'm from Chicago. <laughs> Windstorms, Chicago's known as a windy city because of its politics, but let's pretend it's because of the wind that blows. <laughs> it's got some wicked politics there. <laughs> That's why they call it the windy city. You don't know what's going to happen in Chicago. <laughs> but let's pretend it's because of the Lake Michigan. Great windstorms. But, uh, man, you could be in downtown Chicago and all of a sudden the wind started blowing and blow you across the street. And you don't even see it coming. You're just walking. All of a sudden, whoosh, it's just a powerful wind, especially if it catches between the buildings and the, and the skyscrapers and lines itself up. And whoosh, you get hit by some real wind there. It arose. They, are, they started out, and given the context of the text, in a very calm setting that turned very, very different. And the windstorm arose while they were out there. The Bible said there were waves because when there's a windstorm, it's blowing the sea. Some storms when, uh, that, that come are so violent that they literally can turn over any kind of boat or anybody that's out to sea. And that it can make experienced naval people sick, swaying side to side. Because when that wind blows, it grabs a hold of that water and just begins to throw anything in it and try to turn it over. Now, let me tell you this. There are storms. If you ever want to accomplish the will of God, there's going to be some storms that are going to blow in the midst of trying to accomplish him. It's just that simple. The Bible says 
and instructs us that literally when there's seed thrown down, the Bible said the devil cometh back to tempt and to come against you to get that seed back from you that was thrown down. Every time you're preached to, seed is thrown down and the devil wants to meet you because you rejoiced in here and try to steal that seed back from you. It said people rejoice when they receive the word of God, but then in just a little while, the enemy comes and tempts them and attacks them. He knows they just got seed and he needs to rob that back from them. And the Bible says that this mighty storm happened and I just want to say to you some storms have to do with obedience. We always believe that a storm has to do with disobedience. I was disobedient so the storm came. Some storms happen because you are obedient. And the enemy wants to stop you from getting to the other side. He wants to do anything he can to stop you. It's his last effort. You don't put a boat in the water. You put vision. You put mission in the water. He's got to stop you from getting to the shore because once you walk out on the shore, he's not going to be able to turn you around when you see what God is manifesting and doing and the miracle that God is developing. Listen. Who can make you deny the power of God when you're sitting in this building? When you're here, the devil can't do anything to tell you that this isn't real. But my God, before you leave out on the journey, before you go across the sea, the enemy wants to do anything to stop you. But let me tell you something. This is not the finish of the manifestation of what God is doing. God is about to finish things that would blow your mind, but you just have to be ready to say, I'm going to cross over one more time to the other side. Some storms come because the enemy's attacking you. The Bible said that Jesus is in the stern, in the back of the ship, for anybody who's like me who has got to actually read it and find out where the stern was at. So let me start. The bow, port, and bow. I know that because I read it before I came up here. <laughs> it said that Jesus was in the stern. He was asleep on a cushion, and in some translations calls it a pillow. A pillow gives you a real feeling like you, you know, you, <laughs> you, you really sleeping, right? And the Bible says he's asleep on a cushion. Jesus is calm. This is critical. Jesus is completely calm. The Bible talks about Jesus, you know, having a sense of uh, awareness and a sense of, uh, of, uh, uh, of distress, having a sense of, of uh, identification, of warning and worry, of woe. Jesus has a number of emotions that he goes through while he's here on earth. But in the midst of getting into this boat, he's calm. <laughs> when Jesus says... We're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. <laughs> Jesus already saw what you're looking at that you think is new. It arose. You think it just happened. Jesus said, I already saw that. We're already going to cross over that. Fear not. What are you worried about? I told you to do what? Say it with me. Go to the other side. When Jesus says cross over, then you know he's already seen what the battle is. The Bible said that he is calm in the midst of that. And then they start doing stuff to wake him up. <laughs> you know, they're friends with Jesus. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, in today's vernacular, they were like, hey, yo, man. Hey, we having a problem right now. You, hey, 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 hey. Do you see what's going on out here? There's a real storm, and Jesus was still sleeping through a storm. How do you sleep through a storm? And the Bible said water was coming in the boat. There were problems happening that you could see with your own eyes that would not let you rest unless you weren't looking with your eyes that are human. If you're looking with spiritual eyes, you don't see what other people are seeing. 
You see what God has shown you on the other side and you are undisturbed by the fact that there's an attack going on because attack is the final answer from the enemy to stop you from getting to where God is about to take you. Devil, I know what you're doing. You're trying to stop me from accepting and believing in the will of the Almighty. Not only can you not stop me, I'm on my way. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm going to the other side. If Jesus is sleeping, I'm sure going to sleep while I'm getting there and going to the other side. We sometimes get worried when we see all that out there and everything going on. Folk attacking us and people saying things about us and don't realize the enemy will stir people up. And if we don't listen to God, we'll listen to them and we'll act like them. The one thing I don't want to do when God tells me to cross the other side is cross to the other side with the enemy. The enemy's hoping that I turn my boat around and go back with him and cross back. The enemy done crossed all kind of things and I'm going to sit there and entertain him. I'm on my way somewhere. Look, you may not have nothing to do. Maybe your life ain't going nowhere. But my God, glory to the Lord, I'm on my way to the other side. Not only will I not be stopped, not only will I not be detoured, I'm about to accept the will of the Almighty God, and I'm about to be blessed of the Lord. The Bible said they tried to wake him. Hey, man, you need to get up. And then this is what they said to him. This is a personal attack. It stopped being general. Hey, hey, get up, get up, get up. We are in a storm. That's just general. Now, nobody's married like I'm married. It's because I'm just not the best husband in the entire world. You know what I'm saying? And my wife was given a mission. It was me. <laughs> she, she had tried to cross over to the other side. I was a storm. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so sometimes, you know, when, when people aren't listening to you, you make it personal. Sometimes in an argument, you can change it from being the garbage not going out to you don't take the garbage out. <laughs> you kind of nasty. You're dirty. You know what I'm saying? It just, sometimes the argument can change. Yeah, I'm, I'm not been in an argument like that, but you understand, I'm just trying to relate a few things. But here it is that the argument began to change. The language began to change. Urgency, threat, get you to change your language. All of the stuff that's going on in the environment caused them to change their language that they were using. It changed their confession. Remember, they the one who got the boat together. They the one got everything moving. They're the ones who's steering the boat and taking the other side. Jesus is asleep. Then all of a sudden they changed because there was a storm. Jesus didn't change what he said, but the devil changed what they were saying. And so now they start confessing something different. Jesus, what's wrong with you? And made it personal. They asked Jesus what was wrong with him. Somebody said, can't we just talk to Jesus? Can't we just tell him just the way we feel? Yes, but let's be careful. (laughs) Jesus, just the way I feel. But sometimes you'll end up confessing and saying things to God that you know can't be true. It just can't be true. And so you're just saying, I just want to be real. No, you want to be. Help me, Jesus. The Bible says, do you care? They asked him, do you care? Jesus has been with them and spent all this time with them, done ministry with them. They've slept outside together. They've done all this stuff together. And they say, do you care that we are perishing? What's wrong with you? Because the wind was going and the sea was happening. And Jesus was testing their ability to believe. You see, a real critical thing happened. Jesus had just taught, standing on the shore, with his back to the water, he had just taught everybody 
about what faith was. He gave parables of faith and gave examples of faith, and he really worked the faith thing in. You know, he said faith is like a, a, a grain of mustard seed, and it's just a little bitty thing. But when it grows up, oh, man, plants and trees and everybody can be there. Jesus is really, because imagine what kind of teacher he is. Jesus is pouring it out. Oh, man, let me tell you all, this is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest seed that is around. And when you plant that seed in the ground, it grows to be a mighty tree that people can then literally dwell and live in because it had the DNA. It wasn't have anything to do with what size it was. It had to do with what was in it. Oh, my God. If we ever caught that vision, it has nothing to do with what you did yesterday or all your failures, who your mother was or your father was. It has to do with your spiritual DNA. God has put the Holy Spirit inside of you, and that thing will grow and allow others to have a place to dwell and to live because of ministry. If we will only believe the bible says in mark in this particular chapter that when jesus was leaving it was the, the the ministry to the jews was closing out he had done all this ministry just among the jews but when he was crossing over to the other side he was crossing into gentile territory and when he got off the boat there were insane folk waiting on him he walked into a cemetery not seminary, cemetery. <laughs> he walked into a cemetery and there were crazy folk waiting on him when he got to the other side, when he got to the Gentiles and arrived there. Jesus knew it was a change of ministry and he was calling his disciples, we're now going to leave the time of the Gentile, of the time of the Jew, and we're about to go into the time of the Gentile. Let me tell you something, there comes a time in ministry where God is closing out where you've been and he's about to invite you into a huge, large, theater in a huge large place because now he's about to make your ministry public public used to be a bad word when i went to high school grammar school you know you went to a public grammar school but when it comes to church it's about letting the church go into the community and do the work of God. That means you're going to run into all kinds of grave-like situations and crazy folk that you no longer can run away from. You run toward them. That's right. That's right. But we have to believe there was a change of ministry. He had to occupy the next step. Then the Bible says, once you believe, because believing they're in the midst of this storm and they've got to believe that God has called them to cross over to the other side. And the real statement of believing is confession. No one can make you confess. Don't get me wrong. They can make you say something. But that's not a confession. A confession is what you stand on. It's what you believe. It's what you are assured of. This moment of confession has to come again from the inside. And this is what the Bible says. Jesus awoken after they finally said to him, don't you care? Jesus woke up and said, you know, not, that's a dirty game, y'all. Don't, don't play that game, okay? <laughs> y'all know I care. And Jesus woke up, take a look at them, look at the situation, look at the water coming in the boat, look at what's around him, and let me tell you something. He's still not worried. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Jesus looked at everything that they were talking about, everything they said, look at what's going on. And Jesus looked up and said, and what's happening? When we tell God all about everything that's going on, but God, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know? And God's saying, of course I know. And I knew it would happen when I told you to cross over to the other side. But do you know or do you only see the enemy coming and you don't see how many angels are all around you on every side? 
You see the 1,000 enemy coming, but you don't see the 10,000 angels that are standing around you right now. You can't be touched because God's got you, and when God puts you on assignment, that assignment will come to pass. God will complete his work. He will finish his call. God is not a man that he might lie, that he will not do what he said he would do. It says Jesus woke up. He said, and now listen, follow me for a minute. Since this bothers you, I'll rebuke you. Follow me for a moment. He wasn't going to wake up. The storm was just par for the course. The water par for the course on where they are going. It was, going, it was supposed to make them believe. Right. He taught them faith, and now their faith was supposed to be extended. Right. They were supposed to see the waves. They were supposed to see the water. They were supposed to see everything going on and say, I believe. I believe. The storm should have made them believers, but instead it made them confess doubt. Jesus says, since this living test is not working like it should you are going through a living test in your life and sometimes because you get sidetracked god's got to rebuke the test so you can finish the course and cross over to the other side but let me tell you something i want to learn what it's like to be in the boat and cross over to the other side while the wind is still going, while the water's coming in the boat, while my boat's being knocked side to side, I want to be able to say, but I'm on my way to the other side. I'd like to finish the course without calling on him and saying I'm afraid, I'm scared. Instead saying, Lord, you said it, I believe it, and I'm on my way. Here the Bible says, Jesus spoke to what was going on with them. He didn't speak to what was going on with him. He didn't speak what should have been going on with them. He spoke to get them to believe. And he says, the Bible said he rebuked the wind. And this word rebuke is connected to fighting against something demonic. In the Greek, it actually is a word that's connected to demonic forces. The wind then was literally agitated aggravated by the enemy to produce the waves to stop them from being believers. Jesus stands up and tells the devil, get out the wind. Leave the wind alone. I know you're back there, and I know what you're doing. My disciples are going to be believers, and we're going to cross over to the other side, and I'm about to rebuke you so you get out of trying to torment them. Oh, man, man, sometimes we just need Jesus to rebuke the devil just so we can believe. Now, we should believe all by ourselves. But when we don't, then I'm one of the first people, <laughs> Jesus, rebuke the devil so that I can believe. Jesus, help my unbelief <laughs> so I can get to the other side because I need to get to the other side. Jesus rebukes the wind. But let me tell you, well, this is what he says to the sea. He tells the sea, peace. Be still. He doesn't rebuke the sea. He tells the sea, peace be still. In other words, he tells the sea, look at me. Look at me, sea. Act just like me. Be calm, just like I'm calm, see. I'm about to get the wind off your back, and I want you to be calm and lay down and be calm. So that we have an environment that's conducive for people to use their physical eyes to see what's spiritual. I'm going to change their physical situation so they can see what spiritually is happening. God will manifest physical outcomes around us so that we can see what he's doing, so we can believe him for greater of what he's about to do. God has manifested this physical building around us, not simply so that it would be here. It is an encouragement to you so that you now know what he can do spiritually so you can see more, you can know more, you can do more. Look at what's in front of you and say, God can do greater. This is what Jesus says to him. Jesus says, why are you afraid? He says, do you have any faith? In another translation it says, don't you have faith yet? I just finished doing all that teaching. It's one thing to get something cognitive. 
It's another thing to get it in your spirit and actually walk in faith. God, I want to be a faith walker. I want to believe you. I want to step out on what you say, and I want to do what you have said. I want to quickly say Peter's always got a bad name. Nobody wants to be called Peter. Nobody. Somebody walks up and say, what's up, Pete? You'd be like, no, nah, man, don't call me Pete, man. Call me Paul. Call me somebody else, but don't call me. But really, Peter is an incredible guy. When we say Jesus is the only one to walk on water, that's not true. Peter walked on it with him because he got out of the boat when everybody else was still sitting there. When Peter, when, when Jesus told Peter, when, uh, when Peter told Jesus, I'm not going to let nothing happen to you. I'm not going to let you die. Nothing happened to you. Jesus said, no, Satan, get behind me. Just stop saying all that crazy stuff. But when the moment came down, Peter took out a sword. The only one that said there was two swords there. That's what the Bible said. He picked up one of those two swords with the moment. He said, I told you one of them would put their hands on you. You know, that's what you say about your pastor. The worst thing in the world is to ever put your hands on the pastor. Be like 50 people jump you at one time. Everybody beating you half to death. Don't touch my pastor. That's why I'm not going anywhere over here, right here, right here. There's a bubble right in here, you know what I'm saying? Peter took out that sword, and so some people believe that Peter was trying to fillet that man's ear. Peter was a fisherman. He was not a soldier. He did not know how to fillet somebody's ear. Peter's trying to put that sword in the middle of that man's head, and he's about to take that man out. He takes that sword and the man looking like, ah, oh, and turns his head. And Peter filleted that ear off, but that was not what Peter was trying to do. Peter was about to keep his word. I'm about to send you out of here to the next life right now. Peter was a pretty good guy. And he kind of stepped forward. We got to be the people to walk forward in faith and do what God has called us to do. Jesus had been teaching on faith. Now was the ministry to do the faith. But this is what they finally say after Jesus has done this miracle right in front of their eyes. This is what they say. Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him and obey his power? Who is this? What kind of God do we serve that can take nothing but just dilapidated land and turn it into this? What kind of God do we serve that makes sure that people are fed and people have a place to live? What kind of God do we serve when somebody's on mental illness, running around and crazy, and God can speak to them and bring them and give them their mind back again? What kind of God do we serve that brings people out of sin and brings them into righteousness? What kind of God do we serve that young people can spend their entire life in the church worshiping God and magnifying the presence of the Lord and and don't know much about out there and a lot about what God is doing in here. What kind of God do we serve? This is the moment that they received a promotion because they believed and then they confessed. What kind of God is this? Pastors have been called. This pastor has been called. And he has led you to accept. He has led you to believe. And you confess. But those things came from in here because the Holy Spirit moved on you. Now God is asking, can you increase your faith? Every step we get to is a preparation for the next step God's taking you to. And that takes an increase of faith because you can't take the next step. And this was the issue with the disciples. They had already taken previous steps. God was about to take them on the next step. But the storm came to secure that step and to secure that place. And then it is then that we increase our faith that God takes us to the other side. Just lift your hand right from where you are if you want your faith increased. If you want your faith increased, the higher you lift your hand and the more you lift it up to God is just between you and him. The Bible said that some people began to, that there was a king that because he did not beat the ground with his arrows he didn't get the same response because he was ill prepared to receive what God was doing you know I have nothing to give you and nothing to hand you but between heaven and earth there's a move of God God can do and give you what you need 
Jesus is constantly getting the disciples to increase their faith, to expend themselves and be larger so they can do the kingdom. Now, God needs somebody. He needs logistical officers. He needs some officers that will do what God has called us to do. Now, just now, as you lift your hand up, God's reappointing you. He's reestablishing you. God is repositioning you. Look, God can give you a ministry you don't even have right now. God can do something for you that doesn't even exist right now. But you've got to have the faith to believe that God can do more than what's going on in your life right now. Oh, I'm about to pray in just a moment, but I need your hands up lifted to God. I need you deciding that you want your faith increased and that you're part of the new team with God. And you want to see God do something that is incredible, something that's outstanding. You've already seen God do things that only God can do. And God says he wants to do more, but he needs some people to use. You've got to decide, Lord, use me. Use me, God, for your glory. Just in a few seconds, I'm about to pray. But I need you to start magnifying the God, the Lord, and lifting God up just for a moment. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. God, increase my faith. God, extend my faith, I pray right now. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, God, I pray this very moment for a manifestation of wisdom, a manifestation of knowledge, a manifestation of the gifts of God in this place. God, I pray that you give people wisdom that will cause them to excel. You'll give them knowledge, God, that no one else even knows right now. God, I pray that you do revelation in this house right now. God, I pray, God, you will call people to ministries that don't even exist right now. From nothing, God, make something in this place, I pray. I ask you, God, to do this by your power and by your ability. Now, God, to every uplifted hand, bless it this very moment. Bless it with ministry. Bless it this moment. Bless it, God, with outcome. Bless it with revelation. Bless it with physical, God, manifestation of your God, I pray for miracles. I pray for miracles in the house right now. I pray for miracles in your house. God, I pray for wonders. God, I pray for wonders. God, I pray this very moment that you'll use this church to reach the world in Jesus' name. Now let's give God a praise. Let's give him some worship. Let's magnify him. Thank you, Jesus. Now just one more time before I take my seat. That clap was a clap because you know God is good. Because you know God has done incredible things. I'd like to give you a clap for what God's about to do in your life. What God's going to do in the future in your life. 